Welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa as we focus on labor matters. Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibadru has made a passionate appeal to the organized labor to prevail on the academic staff union of University ASU to call off their strike. The Vice President also urged ASU to embrace the path of dialogue in resolving the crisis necessitating the strike actions. The appeal came just as the VP was making a remark at the 2022 May Day commemoration at the Eagle Square Abuja on Sunday, just to remind you that ASU has been on strike since the 14th of April, or February rather. Joining us now is ASU Chairman in the uh, University of Lagos chapter, uh, Dele Ashiro. Thanks for joining us on the breakfast. I saw you smiling. <laughs> When I was doing that intro. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Thank, Thank you, you for this invitation. Day. Yeah. It's May Day. Uh, <laughs> Nigerians uh, are celebrating, or workers are commemorating the day. Most people are not celebrating, judging by the fact that um, specifically uh, Labour, that's ASU, uh, has been on strike since February. It's been over 70 days, uh, or 80 days, as it were. And um, the young press is still there. And then the vice president is appealing. And you are smiling to, you know, <laughs> labor to intervene on your union. <laughs> well, no, I didn't, I didn't understand that. Even for your laughter. Uh, well, you see, thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's laughable because uh, if you have a vice president that was once a university teacher, in fact, a lecturer in my university. And since he became vice president, Asu had been on strike for at least three times. And the only intervention you are getting from him is to appeal to Asu to call off the strike. Isn't that laughable? That tells you the mindset of the kind of people who rule Nigeria and also aspire to rule at the highest level. It is... It is uncharitable, to say the least, for the vice president of a country, the, a professor of law, a senior advocate. The only intervention is to appeal, asking organized labor to appeal to us. That is, that is, uh, just let's leave it at that. No. The minimum expectation is for the vice president to tell the world that, look, as a former university teacher, let me intervene in this crisis with a view to resolving it. So, with all of the issues we have with government, all the vice president can do is to appeal to organized labor to prevail on us to call off the strike. Is to say the least unbecoming of somebody at that very high level. But, but um, let's even follow up on this conversation that you have actually raised. I mean, the vice president is the vice president and if you look at, you know, responsibility and duties, of course you also would agree that that might not necessarily be it, but doesn't mean that he doesn't have an influence to it, which you have rightly stated. But the implementation, do you think it has to do with, because it's okay for the vice president to say, yes, I'm a former lecturer, this is what it is, I don't support all of this, I'm going to intervene, but can he force implementation? We're talking about funds to be released here. We're talking about, you know, releasing, because at the end of the day, it's about a resource conflict. So what, um, you know, what significance, what uh, impacts can the vice president have on, you know, the ASU strike and the educational sector? I mean, all that's going on. A lot. Okay, so go ahead. A lot. A professor, a former university teacher, somebody who's been in the saddle, and now you are vice president, Look, a, there's a lot he can do. And bear in mind, the crux of ASU strike is not about releasing funds. We are talking about an agreement we have with government since 2009, almost 13 years ago. That agreement is yet to be fully implemented. The agreement itself provides that either government or a union could call for a review of that agreement every three years. It was only last year, 12 years after, that we succeeded in getting government to sit down to renegotiate that agreement. Between that time and today, that agreement is still with government. 
And the vice president cannot say, okay, uh, I'm seeking the leave of Mr. President. Let this matter come before me as a former university teacher. And let me see how I could, you know, intervene. Now that is election time, it's now appealing to us. Call off the strike based on what? The, a university lecturer in Nigeria has been receiving the same salary since 2009 till date. But, but you would also want to agree, I mean, if you follow the developments in this country, not trying to hold brief for the vice president here, but uh, you, you know how it has been a problem to even have the president transmit powers to... That's his... Uh, no, no, no. So uh, in what capacity does he now act and look, say... Bring what, it, what it, I am saying Because you have a minister of education. Seeking the You leave. have a minister of education. A minister of education. All ministers report to the presidency because they are, I mean, appointed by the president. I'm saying seeking his leave. I'm not talking about transmitting power or whatever the politics that is within them in government. What we are saying is that even if he's not going to yield any result, okay, why is he appealing to us to call out the strike now? Oh, so we will yield to his appeal when he failed in intervening in the matter when, I mean, it's, it's, it's best to do so. Okay, let me try and understand the situation right now. It's been 13 years since we've been talking about this uh, uh, agreement reached uh, between ASU and the federal government. But over time, you know, there have been strikes. Uh, ASU would call for a strike. Uh, there will be negotiations and promises by the government. At the end of the day, there will be no, no fulfillment of promises. <laughs> ASU will go back again. It's like, it's like ASU has been too trusting of government and um, they actually haven't really taken it too seriously themselves because each time there have been strikes, they've been called off, there have been more strikes. and uh, So why would this one be different, really? You see, you can't grind a university system in perpetuity. So, and our union believes that union struggle is incremental. You can't... The, the moment, the day you get everything you want in life, life itself will end. So we understand that, look, uh, when we engage government and then we get some concessions, we believe that a responsible and responsive government should, you know, uh, implement an agreement you freely enter to. And if you make promises... Uh, it's only also gentlemanly that you would faithfully implement those promises. Unfortunately, that has not been the beat with successive governments in Nigeria. I mean, take for example, in 2020, we were on a nine-month strike. And government came to say, we will renegotiate the agreement, we will commence implementation, we will pay you your areas of uh, uh, promotion, pay you end academic allowances, and all such, you know, promises. One year after, we're in another May. Nothing. Even the releases that were made were consequent upon, you know, our agitation and sounding the notice of another strike. As I speak with you, government is still in default of two tranches of end academic allowances owing to our members. Government promised that once UTAS is tested, they are going to take us off the IPPIS and deploy UTAS. One year after, UTAS is now embroiled in a political struggle between NITDA, that is a parastatal under a ministry whose professorship, fraudulent professorship, is being challenged by our union. So do you think UTAS um, is actually... Uh, the, 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 the federal government has a a complete uh, disagreement uh, with um, the uh, UTAS uh, payment plan, or what exactly is the issue? Why are they insisting on IPPIs? The, you see two reasons. One, IPPIs is a fraud. How so? Oh. The latest accountant general of the Federation's report, which I have on my phone, and I can spare you a copy here as I live here, and you can share with members of the public, indicted IPPIS. In fact, they have very unkind words in describing IPPIS. We have challenged government to make that report public up to today. Of course, you know that such reports would not see the light of the day, but we have it, and it's not been denied. Not only that, only recently, 
the head of the civil service of the Federation, Mrs. Falash Adiesa, came on air. I don't know whether you reported it. 3,000 or more ghost workers yes, found yes, yes. that was what IPPIS was introduced, you know, to check. And now with IPPIS, there are fraudulent enrollments on the IPPIS. The second reason why they don't want UTAS is that the kind of thing you do on IPPIS, you can't do it on UTAS. Such as? Such as the way UTAS was, you know, developed. Anytime you go on that platform, a permanent report is made for audit purpose on the UTAS platform. And it's permanent. Unless you crash the system, you can't erase it. I think seeing that and the fact that it will no longer be business as usual because the reason why we named UTAS as University Transparency and Accountability is that it ensures transparency at the university level and at the implementation level. In that report I cited, 14 years after the implementation of UTAS, the HR component, human resource component of that platform is still yet to be developed 14 years after. And then you have a payment platform domiciled in the accountant general of the Federation's office. There is no check whatsoever. That will not be the case with UTAS. And having seen, you know, the flexibility of UTAS, the robustness of that software, the dynamic nature in which it functions, the enormous database that it has, and the account accountability and transparency aspect of it, those who have been feeding fat on IPPIS will not certainly allow that platform to see the light of the day. But our union is determined because it is our conviction that unless we want to permanently destroy the last fabric of public university system in Nigeria, that's when you keep us on IPPIS. As I speak with you, go find out. There's nobody on the IPPIS platform that will have any complimentary thing but, but, to but say let's, about But let's IPPIS. also get to this. Uh, the fact that you have the government still insisting, the government had said that uh, the UTAS failed the integrity test. Which is not correct. And the government is also saying that, I mean, when you say not correct, in what sense? Who, who I have the report, the need that, the technical... Be because the government is also saying that they're waiting that they're waiting on, you know, the ASU to go back and upgrade the system, that it failed the integrity that's test. That's a long time ago. We have, I mean, Ingige came and told the world that uh, the technical team of ASU and that of NITDA will sit together to have... NITDA didn't fail. What happened was that the people in NITDA, and I'm saying it, you know, publicly, really don't understand the workings of the university system. And consequently, couldn't appreciate, you know, the robustness of UTAS. Let me give you one example of the so-called failure. Now, in developing UTAS, we realize that the university system is a universal you know, phenomenon, which means that uh, if you hold a BSc in Nigeria, that same BSc is valid anywhere in the world. Not only that, the university system encourages diversity, by which I mean that lecturers should be able to come from other countries, you know, United Kingdom, Canada, anywhere, to teach in Nigeria and vice versa. Now, so what UTAS did was to develop, you know, the keyboard in such a way that it can accommodate all kinds of characters. Because, of course, if you want to write some names, you know, you can put dot either on top or at the bottom and all of that. But Nida came and said, no, that uh, that is not in consonance with best practices. And then we explained that, look, if you want to write my name, for example, as Shola, and you want to write it like a linguist, you have to put a dot either underneath and on the O on top of it and all of that. But Nida insisted that no, that should not be allowed and all that. And within 24 hours, that was corrected. Look, UTAS is developed by the best brains in ICT in Nigeria. And during one of the tests that I witnessed, all efforts to hack 
into the system through what they call the vulnerability test failed. And the technical team of NIDA agreed that that software had been developed in the most sophisticated manner. Look, I will share the report of NIDA with you. I have it on my phone. NIDA was adjudged to have scored 99.3%. Would you say that a system that scored 99.3% failed? By what stroke of mathematical imagination would a, a, a software with over 90% pass rates, all of the tests, failed? So the question to ask is where did the DG of NIDA get that information that he volunteered, you know, at the Federal Executive Council? But we are not surprised. You know, Nigerians uh, and their leaders... Leaders in Nigeria rule Nigeria with half-truth and falsehood. And that's why it's convenient for the DG of NIDA to do what he had done without anybody calling him to question. Our union had challenged the DG of NIDA to a public debate and tell Nigerians how we arrived at that conclusion. Up to today, there has not been any query. There has not been any you know, response from government in reaction, I mean, to the position of our union. I am still saying it, I am on air, that Utah's did not fail. The DG of NIDA was economical with the truth in briefing uh, Federal Executive Council, and they should come and dispute that. Yeah, well, we hope to reach out and, you know, also get uh, the other side of the story. But moving forward, I mean, looking at the essence of, you know, yesterday, today, uh, the, the question would be, how would you describe the welfare of the Nigerian worker, both the public and the private sector, in your words? Shameful. Appalling. Nigeria, a country so blessed, and yet those who moil and toil for the survival of the country are treated in the way that we are all witnessing today. What way? What way? I mean, let's take for example, minimum wage in Nigeria is 30,000 naira. What is 30,000 naira going to buy? A bag of rice, as we speak in Nigeria today, is more than 30,000 naira. So, what it means is that a worker cannot even afford one bag of rice in a month. So, it is shameful, and it is in the same country that an application form to become president is a hundred million. That tells you, and forty million. That tells you, I, I'm taking the upper limit. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you the degree of inequality, and the fact that those that are rich in Nigeria are doing so in complete disregard for the workers of the country. That, to my mind, is, is, is to say the least All right. shameful. Okay, let's still stay on um, also. I just want to understand um, what um, is on right now. As, it's, as we speak, what's the latest uh, with um, the negotiations with federal government? Or what's the situation <laughs> as we speak? Uh, is there any glimmer of hope? What's the position right now? Maybe after the, the conventions. As we speak, nobody is even Seen, yeah. is even bothered about whether over two million Nigerian students are at home. It's been over seventy-five days. Yeah. You know, it, we are aggrieved and justifiably so. Look, the highest professor, the highest-paid professor in Nigerian university today earns less than $500 in a month. Its total take-home is 416000 naira. So it's not even up to 500000 It's not. Shocking, you see. And to be a professor, first you must have the highest degree, which is a PhD. You must be one of the best in that discipline. That's why they say you are a professor. And you must have taught in a university for a minimum a minimum of 20 years. Now, having done all that, all you take home is 416,000. 
Now, that's not up to what you know, a fresh intake into CBN takes in a month. Or NNPC or all of those so-called cash cows. So, when you see a, a society like that, you think that that society can develop? Can go beyond the level that it is at the moment? So, what we are saying is that we are aggrieved, we declare the strike, first a rollover strike for four weeks, thinking that, look, given the issues, government can put its ass together and within four weeks resolve these issues and then we go back to work. Right. After the first four weeks, nothing. We had a rollover for eight weeks. The eight weeks have since lapsed or will lapse maybe next week. And as I speak with you, all we get from the Minister of Labor is, you know, some ego tripping mm. about what he has done or what he has not done. The Minister of Education is even nowhere to be seen or heard. Relevant agencies of government are also unlooking. The latest we have received as Workers' Day gift is the appeal by the Vice President that we should go back to work hungry, haggard, you know, disoriented. Right. Uh, so we've been told that we have uh, Chris Onyeka via phone. He's the NLC chairman, if I'm not mistaken. Chris Onyeka, it's good to have you join us this morning on The Breakfast. It's good to be here. Chris Onyeka, can you hear us? I can hear you very well. All right, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show. Uh, that's The Breakfast. Of course, we're looking at the welfare of the Nigerian worker and uh, looking at the Workers' Day celebration. But quick to you, what mm. has labor, what has labor done over the years? I mean, uh, you know, to ensure that the lives and the standard of living of the Nigerian worker has improved. I mean, we're still grappling with 30,000 naira minimum wage. Some states have not implemented across the entire federation. Yeah, um, Nigeria is, uh, uh, is <laughs> uh, it's unfortunate to use such language, but I know that Nigeria is, uh, has a prevalence of lawlessness at all levels of governance. Uh, the minimum wage of 30,000 naira, every Nigerian still remembers the struggle and the processes that led uh, to, uh, to its enactment into law. Yet, the same governments that participated in the process, uh, most of them have refused to implement it to the letter. And so it's, it's unfortunate that that is happening in some states of the Federation. Even the 18,000 naira minimum with the old one was not implemented by them. Then the 30,000 naira was also not being contemplated to be implemented. We have been engaging them, writing letters. Some of them will go and strike, uh, like you had what, what, what happened in Kaduna State and in some other states. But we will continue engaging them because this is Nigeria. Most of the people that are supposed to be talking about, you know, the welfare of the workers in Nigeria are busy campaigning for 2023 election. So Nigerians are on their own. Workers are on their own. But we just want to go through this meeting. After this meeting, we come out with another robust framework for engaging this impunity uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's clearly unlawful for governments to uh, insist on not implementing their own law, not our own law now. Uh, so that is the situation we have found ourselves as, as workers and as, like, as citizens of a lawless country. It's unfortunate, but we will not throw their hands, and but we must do something. All right, mm. uh, all right, Chris Onyeka. We yeah. have um, the ASU chairman, uh, University of Lagos chapter here with us in the studios. And uh, 
We were talking about other labor issues, specifically education and ASSO strike, which has been on for over 75 days. And specifically, the vice president um, asked, uh, you know, labor to intervene uh, on uh, ASSO so that they could actually call off the strike. What's the position of the Nigerian Labor Congress on the ASSO strike? The, the, the Congress national leadership has already taken a position on the ongoing strike. ASU is an affiliate of NLC. And ASU has reported the federal government to NLC. And NLC has taken, in conjunction with ASU, uh, uh, some, uh, some demands which has been sent to the, to the federal government. The vice president asking NLC to intervene now is actually uh, uh, something that you should have known that we have intervened already. And our intervention is already in the public space and is with the federal government. So the federal government knows what we have asked them to do. Asu strike is something that is not new to anybody. And every Nigerian and parents know that government is at fault. And we are pleading with the federal government to look at those issues that we raised, those demands that we sent to them at minimum uh, levels that we can accept and implement them. If they implement them, ASU will go back to work. And that is the truth about it. We stand behind ASU. We support ASU, not just as an affiliate, but as responsible organizations in Nigeria that the federal government has shown serious signs of irresponsibility as far as tertiary education is concerned in Nigeria. So we support ASU totally. We have intervened already. There is no other way we can intervene except that we are going to call on a nationwide strike to, to, to support ASU. So that the federal government will know and understand that Nigerians cannot be taken for granted. We are all stakeholders in the Nigerian journey. We are parents. Our students are affected. And the educational sector is affected. So it's our responsibility to ensure that we support ASU fully so that the tertiary education sector will be restored to its former glory. Okay, that um, is the position of the NLC. All right. I, I mean, quickly on, on this one, I mean, Labour has been accused of uh, several compromises, and that is why you have, I mean, including us with the strikes, been very prolonged over time. So you, it feels like you, you call off the strike one minute. Uh, you say there's going to be a strike action two days after, three days after the strike is called off. Uh, government gets into an agreement over time. They don't implement it. People, I mean, do you have quotas saying that there's been a compromise on the pattern. That's why the government has never respected because they feel like they would always go back in bed with us. I really don't know, but how do you defend this? Hello, I, I didn't hear that. I didn't get that one very well. So, so that, I mean, you have school of thought saying that ASU, uh, let's just say labor now, has been compromising over time. Labor <laughs> and the federal government, uh, you have them getting in bed and that's why uh, you, you don't really have results, even when you have labor and backing on strike. For instance, you have ASU now on strike. Uh, government is not even blinking an eyelid, even though they're having conversations. I mean, you can see what's even going on. The strike has been prolonged. We're talking about issues that would have been implemented over how many years ago, up until this moment. Some people are saying it's because labor have compromised over time with the government. <laughs> see, most of the time, you, when you talk about compromise, you ask yourself, for how long can you continue compromising? There is always a point when you say, no, I will no longer move backwards. There is always an irreducible minimum. The, uh, the, the Nigerian Labour Congress, working in conjunction with ASU, has reached that point where it can no longer compromise. 
So because you the compromise at this point. Compromise. So are you saying you that the compromise, has compromise over time? Is the destruction of the educational system. By extension, we lead to a destruction of our nation. Because a nation without a sound educational basis is a nation that is not prepared to develop. Look at the rot in our system. You can link it easily with the decay in the educational system. This battle by ASU is actually an existential battle. It is a battle for the soul of Nigeria. And so, we have all reached to that level. We are all prepared to make sacrifices. All right, I uh, have three kids all right, Chris, so in we'll, the we'll tertiary education. All right, Chris, we'll and come back to you. Hello, Chris, just um, hang on. I just want to get... Uh, you know, Mr. Okay. Asher's um, comment, I will come back to you to talk more about um, this issue of Ashton, of course, other issues concerning the Nigerian um, uh, worker. Let's talk about um, all of this now. In the news today, we read that the NLC, you know, is going to vote only uh, worker-friendly uh, government or candidate or aspirant. Uh, you know, what is ASU doing? Because right now, there is... a. Uh, 2023, that's what's on the lips of most uh, uh, government administrators, and most times they have actually put um, governors to the back door. What is ASU doing this time around to ensure that um, come 2023, you know, it will not be business as usual? <laughs> you see, the position of ASU politically is clear. And the position is that uh, we are not seeking accommodation nor compromises within this discrepant capitalist system that we are currently running. What ASU desires is a complete system change along socialist lines. Mm. We believe that irrespective of who becomes what in 2023, if the system remains the way it is, we'll be back to ground zero. And President Olusha Gombasanjo once told us that, that even if you bring our Lord Jesus Christ to rule Nigeria, it will fail. So that tells you that the position of our union is vindicated. We believe that unless we change this system as it is presently, mm. irrespective, and look at, let's start with political parties the two so-called dominant political parties. How do they stand apart? And look at the fluidity. Somebody can be a PDP member in the morning, and by 6 p.m. is already an APC member. There's nowhere in the world you run a political, a democratic system in that manner. The parties are bereft of ideas. There is no guiding ideology. The dramatist personnel, they have remained the same over the years. Uh, Nobody is held accountable to party manifesto. It is individuals now that funds the party. And consequently, they are able to take over the party. There's cult of personality. You can go on and on. So the position of our union is what we desire is a system change. And we are going to work with the mass of the people, organized labor, you know, artisans, market women, and all that. Already we have a political arm of our union, which we call the CEPED, Center for Popular Education. We believe that it is by educating Nigerians and making them understand that whether it is APC or PDP or PWD or whatever, you know, as long as the system remains the same, the way it is, capitalist, mm -hmm. neo-colonial, you know, dependent, the society will only be ruled by this coterie of elites. All right, thank you, Mr. Azure. Um, Chris, I'm afraid that we can't get back to you. We actually have um, spent so much time on this discussion. But we must say a very big thank you to you. Chris Onyeka is a member of the Nigeria Labour Congress, and he joined us to discuss some pressing issues concerning labour matters and indeed uh, ASU. And of course, back here in the studio, we had uh, Dele Ashuru, mm -hmm. uh, Chairman ASU, University of Lagos Chapter. Thanks for being a part of this conversation. Thank you very thank much you for, for this coming. invitation. We really appreciate you know, your support in enlightening the public about our troubles. Thank you very much. I right, thank you so much indeed. Again, Chris uh, 
Onyeka. It is still the breakfast. Thank you so much. TV. Yeah, it is our Thank pleasure. You. Yeah. It is the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Away from labor matters in a moment when we return, we're we'll looking at the you know the essence of an idol for Trey. It is a, a public holiday and um, our Muslim brothers are celebrating. We will come and read that with them in a moment to join us again. <laughs>